Hello everyone, uh, I'm Doris Forster and I am back um, with another talk on global gender equality, uh, looking at that through global population statistics and trends and seeing if we can um, unpack or, or discover what the underlying causes of gender inequality are. Um, and so this talk is going to be the last one I'm going to do that revolves around uh, global fertility rates. So what I've been doing over the last few talks is looking at um, the relationship between uh, gender equality and uh, global fertility rates. And basically what we tend to see is economic development is tied to, to fertility rates um, and also tied to a gender equality. So the lower the fertility rate, the greater the gender equality, and the greater the economic development. So the talks that I have done in the past um, look at different components of what results in one country having a high fertility over another country having lower fertility. And um, I, I didn't look at everything that uh, determines fertility rate. I picked the ones I thought were the most important or the ones that contributed the most to higher low fertility. And um, the ones I think uh, governments should be tackling in order to not only bring down fertility rates, but also increase the gender equality in your country. So last, the last talk I did was on education and the importance of education. And, and there's been great gains that have happened throughout the world, and I hope that continues to happen. But that's only one little component of this greater picture of gender equality. Um, and so today I'm going to look at marriage, the age, uh, the average age of marriage and the average age when a woman has her first child. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to connect that to the education part. Uh, so looking what's in front of you is the five barriers uh, to girls' education. And this particular uh, visual, I like this visual, so this is the one I, I wanted to use, is um, from a charity group called... Um, organization called Girl Up, and this is work that they're doing in Uganda. But these five barriers can be applied to girls in many, many countries around the world. Um, and they look different depending on the development level, level and geographic location of the country. But these are things that females experience more so than males. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but I just wanted to touch on them. So poverty uh, looks different in, in different countries. It can be from school fees. Um, at the primary, secondary, or post-secondary level, or one one level, like in in, in Canada, uh, parents um, or students have to cover fees for post-secondary, but uh, primary and secondary costs are covered. In other countries, they're not. So that could be a barrier. The other barrier uh, could be um, in certain countries, school uniforms are mandatory, and that families that struggle to pay. For for the school uniform, it could also be a barrier. Uh, we look at gender-based violence. Uh, that is another issue. And I, I think of some of the, the stuff that happened um, in Nigeria with some of those schoolgirls that were um, kidnapped. And I, I can relate it to that as, as that being a barrier. Either families are afraid to send their kids to school for those reasons. And there's always that risk. Um, Looking at up at the top, lack of girl-friendly school environments, and this was something I didn't think of for a long for for years until um, somebody made a presentation at my school, and uh, they said that several girls in our board um, didn't attend school when they were menstruating because they couldn't afford to buy the tampons and the pads, and so there was a, a campaign to bring that into the schools and. Um, hopefully, see an increase in attendance, but it's a problem all over the world. Um, because females menstruate, and if you can't afford the products to deal with that, then you might not go to school on those days. The other one, gender inequality, this one is one, it's cultural, I think, and I, I think it's going to take time uh, to reculture a society that it's important to educate your females. And I think it's happening slowly in certain parts of the world and a lot quicker in others. And basically, the idea is that... Um, People feel if, the, if, if females are getting married at a young age, what's the purpose of sending them to school? And they're, they're more valuable working at home, either in the fields, um, childcare, chores around the house, inside the house. Or um, one of the big, big things that females in the developing world are doing is going to collect water. Some countries that have water scarcity issues, females are the main um, people that are actually going to collect the water. They're walking for kilometers to get that water, maybe a, an hour walk just to, 
to retrieve the water and then back into the home. And so school is not the priority in, in those countries. But And the last one is the one I'm going to talk a little bit about, and this is child marriage and early pregnancy. And so there is a connection uh, between the, the average age that a female gets married and the number of children that she has and how early she has children. So the earlier the marriage, um, the higher the fertility, and typically the earlier, the younger they are when they have their first child. And it's all about that window that you can conceive, right? And if you get married at 30, the window is smaller than if you get married at 15. So the idea here is to um, push back marriage, having girls going to school, and having girls doing other things, perhaps gaining gainful employment, and then there's food security that they are able to um, ensure for themselves and their family. And then finally, uh, health improves, and then everything kind of works together. And then what we see ultimately at the end is an increase in gender um, equality for females. So that is the focus today. And so I just wanted to show you a few um, uh, of uh, the components that go into helping us understand where in the world we're getting married younger than others. So this is um, the most recent uh, stats I can find on average age of uh, a woman's uh, when they get married. In Canada, for some reason, we don't have data for it, and we don't have data um, for some other countries, and I'm not sure why. Uh, so the no data is those countries there, and I'm not sure whether they're not, again, not collecting it or it's not accurate or they, they collect it at um, different times, of, at like different years, like our census data years are different than when they've collected this information. So I just wanted to go, uh, what's, what's encouraging that we have nobody that um, the average age is between 10 and 15, because that window, first of all, it, it would, um, um, maternal mortality increases and you would have an increase in uh, child mortality if you're having babies that young. Uh, so 10 to 15, there's not many countries, but here we have from 15 to um, 20, we have several countries. And if we just hover over, we have Chad, the average age is 18. Here it's 17 in Niger, uh, Mali it's 19, so it's young. And so again, the window between um, when you can get pregnant and when women start to um, go into menopause is quite large and so there's multiple children that can be born during that time. There's our 20 to 25, our 25 to 30 in average the countries and then our uh, 30 to 35. So it seems that the majority of countries in the world women are getting married between the ages of 20 and 25 and we can see that certain countries have higher fertility uh, partly because they're getting married younger. In Canada, the last stat that I saw was 28 was the average age of marriage. And when, so when you push back, um, or when women are getting married later, one of the one of the reasons is they're going to school, they're working, um, and they're making that choice to marry later, not to get married, and to have their children later. And so they tend to have one or two versus four, five, or six. And so the other one I wanted to look at is um, the mean age at first birth because that relates to when they get married. And I'm just going to make this just a bit smaller so that we can take a look um, at the, the whole map. And so what we'll see is the darker purples are um, having children 18 to 20 years old. And again, it's all about like if you're having your first child at 18, you're likely to have more children than if you're having your first child, like in Canada does, uh, between 27 and 28 years old. So there we have, again, Africa stands out as having children young in life. Um, also, the Middle East uh, stands out as, as well. And we tend to see higher um, fertility rates here, and we also tend to see higher uh, gender inequality in these countries. So you can see there starts to become a pattern with everything that I've talked about, infant mortality, maternal mortality, contraception, um, education, and it, it, it all relates to one another. So it's not like a country can go and say, okay, I'm going to fix this one thing and then every, you know, fertility rates are going to come down. Uh, come down. It's going to be a, a, a number of things that have to happen. But I think it, one making one move, like education for me is where I think it should start. So if you do that, then I, I, I feel that um, these other things will all come into play. And then we will see um, an increase in gender equality. 
So the next, um, the next one <laughs> thing I wanted to just show is the minimum legal age for marriage um, worldwide. And what's encouraging that the majority of this map is green. So it's 18 and over. But there's some stipulations there. Some countries have um, 18 or over is the legal age to get married, but they will allow marriages under 18 if there's certain conditions met or the government approves or parents have an approval. And then that goes back to culture. So if it's culturally acceptable or part of the culture that women get married young, uh, then the parents are going to approve and sign whatever documents that they need to sign. What's interesting is that the United States, it's 9 to 13. Um, and then we have Chad, 14 to 15. And, you know, we've seen Chad come up uh, a number of times in, in the last few talks. Um, Saudi Arabia is 9 to 13 as well. And then we have a couple of countries, a few countries, more than a couple, but uh, 16 to 17. And then the majority of the world, um, it is 18, which um, I, I'm happy to see that. But I wish uh, it translated um, into actually... Uh, it being illegal um, to marry under 18 under any circumstance. So I know this comes out of the United States, but the data is good. So I wanted to look at the laws concerning child marriage for girls, and this is 2020, so it's fairly recent. You can see the countries in green, and again, we have more green than we don't, which is good. Um, it's illegal. However, look at what's in the brackets, and or only granted with judicial approval. And we don't know what countries have the and or, like, only granted with judicial approval, so we're not sure what's happening there. I can see some countries now that I know have issues with child brides, India, I can see Pakistan, and so um, it's not being reflected in this map, but it's it's encouraging that we have laws. Uh, the the uh, red, countries that are in red, it's legal to marry under the age of 18. And we remember I just showed you the map of the U.S. It was 13 to 14, I think, was the um, the age limit. So that's it's it's interesting that a developed nation would have um, that as the minimum age. Mexico and we can see Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, various countries. But it's interesting that Chad actually has its at 18. Okay, so if you're getting married young, you tend to have your babies younger. And then as a result of that, you're going to typically have a higher fertility rate. And we know um, that with a higher fertility rate and having babies younger, the, the opportunity for education is not there. They're, they're mothers, so they're, the ladies are not going to school. Economic opportunities do not present themselves. So these are women that are working in the home. And that empowerment um, doesn't happen because they're then dependent on um, their spouses to bring home the income um, and help with the financial costs of different things that the family needs. Even though women are working, but it's unpaid work and it's not valued the same. Okay, and I just wanted to show um, this stat. So this is the percentage of girls married before the age of 18, and it kind of goes through the countries. And if you look at them, again, Africa. Um, and the only Asian country that comes into this top list is Bangladesh. But 76% of females in Niger are marrying before the age of 18. So that's a lot of women that are going to likely have children early in life. And that's going to translate to higher fertility. And then you can see all the connections. It's like domino, right? A domino game, or when everybody sets up those dominoes, um, one factor can can affect the next, can affect the next, and affects the next, affect the next. So then you, you have Central African Republic. Chad comes up. It's third. 67% of the females getting married in Chad are marrying before, or sorry, under the age of 18. Bangladesh, Mozambique, um, South Sudan, Somalia, Mali. And those are all countries that also have high fertility. And unfortunately, they have um, uh, lower gender equality. And then this one's just on violence, and that goes hand in hand with, um, it, not necessarily uh, fertility, but it's just interesting to see. I'm not sure how they collect that data, and I do think some of this data is, um, the number should be higher because people don't report it, but um, I just thought I would share that. 
So that's um, it for me for uh, child marriages and total fertility rates. Join me next time when the focus will be on human trafficking and the impact that that has on females. That's it for now. Have a great day. Bye.